Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. We are excited to be back with you all and talking about being a connected parent and what that can look like. And especially in this world that we're living in, what it can look like to be more connected. And we would always say that starts with being connected as a person. And David, I'm just curious what you would say helps you be more connected, connected to your kids, connected to the people in your world, connected to your own heart. Mm. And again, you can't say tacos. (sighs) Sorry. The fact that you keep taking that away from me, (laughs) making this so hard. We'll let you pick one. All right. I'm going to say we talked in an earlier episode about the wisdom of the Enneagram, and I have been doing more studying around that lately, and you all heard me say in our episode on being an intentional parent that we've just seen that be a really valuable tool for parents, and it has been for me just helping me see all of how I relate to those around me, and you all heard Sissy tell on that episode that we're both Enneagram Ones, and the name given to the one is the perfectionist or the reformer. We see everything that's wrong in the world, and we want to make it right, and you can just imagine all the ways that plays out in the arena of parenting, and one of the places where I talk a lot with one parents that we can get stuck is how messy our kids' rooms are, Mm. so if you're a parent out there listening and you are particularly triggered by that. I think it would be several numbers that are <laughs> ones in particular. And I can't help but walk into my kids' rooms and immediately see whose bed didn't get made, dirty clothes laying in the corner of the rent, like all the things before I can see the person. And I was challenged by an Enneagram teacher I love to say that ones who are parenting teenagers should go into their kids' rooms less try to get it down to a couple of times a week and that has been a game-changing practice for me because i have three kids two of them are twin boys and they're teenagers which simply means that their room both looks and smells like a fraternity house (laughs) (laughs) and so when i go in it triggers all kinds of alarms and sirens inside of me that I simply do not want to be defining our relationship or the first thing that I know. So I've been going into their room less, and it has changed my connection with them. Mm. It's amazing. So that is my practice. What are you discovering about connection? You know, I love that you said that, and it made me think about how often, I don't know if you feel like this, but I feel like I do parent consults with parents who are ones all the time, and maybe because ones are so hard on themselves, and I think want help genuinely, and I would imagine there are a lot of you that are listening that are ones, because I think ones would listen to parenting podcasts too. Because we want to do the right thing. Right, exactly. Two things that I have learned that are really important about ones including us, but I think ones that I meet with, I always start off sessions with ones saying, I know you are trying so hard. And really every parent out there. And if you're a parent who would listen to a parenting podcast, again, you are trying so hard. And so we would always want to say we are on your team and cheering you on in light of that. And and I think what you said was so interesting as a dad who's a one, because one of the things I've learned about all of us as ones is that we don't see detail. Like everything has the same degree of emphasis for us. And so of course a room or, you know, that idea of choosing your battles, which we're going to circle back around to on another episode, but it's hard because it's like, we just can't categorize. And I think that's part of it 
an important thing for us to talk about at some point along the way moving forward. So, okay, me being connected, I love that we're also talking about in this season being a student of yourself, because there are things that we learn about ourselves growing up. And my mom would always laugh and say that when I had friends over, I would come to her and say, it's been really fun having so-and-so over. When are they going home? And then what that turned into as an adolescent is that people would get on my nerves so much and I would have to pull away. And I would think it was about that person frustrating me. And the older I've gotten, the more I really have realized that's about being introverted. And so the thing that helps me connect the most is probably to disconnect. And so Mm. I think to be aware of the things like we keep talking about that get triggered in you and what do you need, what frees you up to connect as a parent and as a person, I think is always important to be aware of, whether that's time on your own, time with your friends, time outside of your children's bedrooms, whatever that looks like, to think about what frees you up to connect more freely and more deeply, I think is really important. David, I would love for you to talk more about what you really do think it looks like to be connected and what you've learned, again, over all these years of sitting with families. I'd love to. And then I want you to talk for a minute about what you hear parents say gets in the way of connection. I would say if we think first about how to move toward connection, I think the most important place to start is thinking about entering into your kid's world, thinking about what they love, and knowing that that's going to change all throughout development. If you are parenting a four-year-old boy right now, your entry point to just enjoying them might be Legos. If you're parenting a 14-year-old boy, your entry point might be video games, (laughs) neither of which for moms listening, may be anything you particularly (laughs) love or enjoy. But I think there is something so important about stepping into that place from time to time and and first and most figuring out what that is. Because I think Sissy and I would both say one of the things we're seeing and hearing from parents consistently is that they feel overwhelmed. And this is maybe the busiest, fastest paced time in all of our history of doing this work. And it's harder to just find those places of enjoyment and connection and just entering into our kids' world. And I think back on talking about four-year-olds, when my daughter, my firstborn was four, she discovered the American girl phenomenon. And I don't know if any of you out there listening have had that discovery happen in your household, but I wish that I'd known it was coming so I could have bought stock in the American Girl Corporation because I've invested deeply financially over the years. She discovered the bitty baby first and then that there is a lookalike doll and a doll for every year and doll for every era in history, just dolls and dolls and dolls. And so (laughs) for many years, every birthday and Christmas, that was all life was about. And if I wanted to just connect with and enjoy that little girl in that season, those dolls were my best entry point. In fact, you've heard me say that she would set these elaborate tea parties and I would ask her if I could come and she would say, if you wear a blazer. So I would put on a blazer with my pajama pants and try to be very engaged in the play. And I would look to my left and say, Molly, would you pass me a muffin, please? And she would often look at me disgruntled and say, she's not talking to you because that is Samantha. And my (laughs) daughter was so upset when I didn't know the names of these dolls because they were like family members. They ate at our dining room table. They went on vacation with us. We nursed them to health. Those dolls were my entry point to just enjoying her and connecting with her. And obviously, she's way past that point. She's in college now. Those dolls are packed up. And I remember her moving into adolescence. We sit with so many parents of teenagers who will say it's never felt harder to connect with them. One, because they don't especially want to be with us the most in that season of life. And secondly, because they can be a little hard to be with in that season (laughs) of life. And so whatever the obstacle may be, we have to work harder to connect with adolescence. And so I was feeling that right as she was entering in. And I remember saying to my wife, I, I had heard that Taylor Swift was 
coming through town and going to stop off at our big arena for a few nights. This was back on the Red Tour. And I said to my wife, okay, she's about to turn 13. If I could score some tickets to the Taylor Swift show, I think she would be seen with me in public. And I think we could have this really great night of connection together. And so I got the tickets, but my very wise wife said, it is not enough to just take her to the concert. You need to download some Taylor onto your phone. You need to listen to the songs, know the music, so you can have a conversation. She was so right, and I did. And I would listen when we were in the car together and hand my phone back and let her pick her favorite songs. And then I tried to listen when she wasn't in the car because I wanted to sound informed. And And I'm here to tell you that I got pretty good. I may just break into Shake It Off here in the next few minutes. <laughs> I might may, be a little scared. I sing a little folklore for you. <laughs> yeah, you should be scared. I won't. I promise. The point simply being as ridiculous as that sounds, dolls and music, those were entry points. Those were entry points. And I want you to hold on to that because, again, I think that's harder than ever to find time and space to just enter into those places because I think the foundation of connection really is – relationship. And we'll come back in a few minutes to an intentional practice that might help you think through what that is for your kid right now. But talk about what gets in the way. Well, I love that you tell that story. And I'm just going to say right now about you as a dad, Dave and I were talking last night. We have a fundraiser every year called Evening in December, and we have different artists come and sing Christmas carols. And so we're always wanting to be connected to artists. And there is a new artist that moved to town who happens to have boys and girls. And so through kind of a random series of events, I got to meet them and took them, Raising Worry-Free Girls in Wild Things. And immediately, David's response last night in our conversation was, I have to text Lily. That's her favorite artist. I'm going to text her right now. And so the fact that that's still so much a part of your parenting, and that's awesome. You gave me a lot of street cred for that action. Thank you. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Did you know that Minnow has an award-winning children's Bible? Written by VeggieTales creator Phil Vischer, the Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible for Kids is more than a children's Bible storybook. It's a deep, engaging, and whimsical gospel experience. Each Bible story is vividly illustrated, takes just minutes to read, and includes a family connection to encourage readers to learn, talk, and pray together. Find out more at shop.gominnow.com. That's shop.gominno.com. So I would say one of the biggest blocks to connection, hands down, maybe the biggest in this day and time is technology. It just makes it so hard. And it makes it so hard in a lot of ways. I think it makes it hard to connect with the kids that we love because they get sucked into screens like nothing else in their lives. And it feels like we lose them. But I would also say on the flip side, we are hearing more kids talk about having to compete with technology for their parents' attention than we've ever heard before. And so it really does go both ways. And I think we've all had that experience of being at a restaurant and looking at the table next to us, and there is a parent and a child, and they're both on screens. And how tragic that is to sit next to them and see that happen. And so a few ideas that we have in light of that. I mean, one thing as we think about technology and kids in general, but if you're sitting there thinking, yes, I do not want to get to that point. My kids are younger. I would like to delay screens as long as I possibly can because I don't want to lose them in that way. What can I do? Our rule of thumb in all things technology, is you don't want to be the first to let your kids have whatever device, whatever platform, but you also don't want to be the last. If you are the first, your child is going to be perceived as, we don't use the word fast anymore, but that would be the word that comes to mind. You don't want your child to become known in their peer group as cutting edge, because cutting edge gets scarier and scarier and scarier as they grow up. And so if they're the first, that's often how they're going to be perceived. But if you're the last, and I wish I had the statistics in front of me, but if you're the last, they're going to be the statistics of 
kids that don't necessarily have a device but are regularly borrowing their friends' devices to get on the social media platforms, creating their own identity on social media on their friend's phone. And so our rule of thumb, what we encourage parents to do is to be the next to last, (laughs) if you can, basically meaning you want to hold off as long as you can, but you need a safe group of other families that you decide together This is when we're going to let our kids get their first little email address. This is when we're going to let them get on social media. This is when we're going to, before social media, this is when we're going to let them have their first phone. And that way, when your child says, everyone else in my class, because your child will say, everyone else in my class at some point along the way, when they do, you have automatic backup. And you know three other families who don't have it yet either. I met with a mom just this past week, and she came in because she said, I just need you to tell me if I'm being reasonable or not. And then she went on to lay out that they didn't have phones with her kids. And I said, tell me about her grade. Tell me about her class or their other kids. And she said, you know, we're doing life with a handful of other families. And she said, so I know of five other families whose kids don't have phones in her grade. And I said, absolutely hold on to that. Because you do want to hold off as long as you can, because it becomes a force to be reckoned with in the lives of your kids. And so we would say that first, be the next to last. And then second, we would say, as a family, practice technology Sabbath. So whatever you need to use to get there, and I talked with another family about that this past week, who were saying, we can't get our daughter off screens. There's just nothing we can do. We can't get her to come out of her room. Basically, parenting, in a lot of ways, one of the things that you're doing is you are being external boundaries until they develop internal boundaries. And they don't have those yet. And so with screens particularly, you're going to have to do that. And Apple now just baked into their devices. They have great screen regulators. Also, there is a great hub called Circle that helps you create boundaries around your kids' devices and create bedtimes. And you can have your own devices on circles. So you're not only monitoring and regulating their time, but you're regulating your own. And so in that, as a family, you can take technology Sabbath and maybe you, Sunday afternoons, nobody uses screens at all, or you have a commitment as a family that we're going to use screens each a certain amount at night when we're all at home, or we're not going to use them at all unless it's an emergency on whichever nights. And again, that would depend on the age of your kids. And we have some great information in Modern Parents Vintage Values about helping put boundaries around screens and your kids and things to be aware of. Also, we have a great resource for you in terms of technology with our Minnow friends that we love and respect so much. And if you go to gominnow.com, G-O-M-I-N-N-O dot com. They have a life guide that we were a part of that is all about helping create really responsibility in terms of technology with your kids and how to help foster that. And so that would be a huge resource we would recommend in terms of technology. And it would give you a lot more ideas than just the two. That feels so important and so needed. And I think about every parent I know would say that's one of the bigger barriers to connection with their kids. And so it just feels needed. You know, when we do parenting seminars locally, we take sometimes a group of kids to do Q&A. And it's interesting because I would say eight years ago, the things that parents were most panicked about and asked kids about the most was sex and talking to your kids about sex. And it has 100% shifted to technology. That's what it feels like this anxiousness is about in parents. So, yes, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Who knew that we'd ever miss talking about sex? <laughs> <laughs> Technology, <true>. scary animal. <laughs> but it, again, just feels so important because it can be such a barrier. And we want to talk about the barriers and we want to talk about how to move more there because we would say to any parent listening that, Laboring in this space is so important. Identifying those places of enjoyment and connection, figuring out what gets in the way of that, because the long-term payoff of this is so rich. And that's the other advantage of having done this work for as long as we've done this now. We, we officially now see kids who come in for parent <laughs> consultations about their own children that, that we knew as so – I know that we knew as middle schoolers. So we've getting to see the full – 
span of development and what it looks like on the other side. Mm-hmm. And we do believe the the long term payoff of connection is extraordinary. And it fascinates me all the different ways I've heard kids report that. And I think back on a, a couple of years ago, I was meeting with a young man. I met this kid for the first time after he had lost his mom to brain cancer. And I said to him in our very first appointment, I said, I wish I had had the privilege of just knowing your mom, but I would love it if you'd be willing to just tell me about her. And he was describing her. And then I just said, what's one of your favorite memories of her? And he didn't even have to think. Like he just immediately said, I remember this night she called us down for dinner like she always did. My sisters and I came down the stairs and we rounded the corner and my mom had pulled the dining room table over to the side. She threw a quilt on the floor. She lit candles and we had dinner on the floor by candlelight and we just laughed a lot. And I remember being so struck by his answer to that. And when I think about his answer, I think, that experience was all about connection. It was really simple. It was dinner, which we're doing all the time with our kids, but dinner in an unpredictable way that involved a lot of laughter and a whole lot of connection. So as you're hearing us talk around these things, connection doesn't have to involve expense. Connection doesn't have to involve extravagant experiences. Connection happens in the everyday when you do dinner in an unpredictable way, when you turn on music while you're making dinner and setting the table and kids are doing their normal chores, that could become a vehicle for connection. We think about bringing music and all these different ideas we've been talking around. And so as we think on this and and move into talking about intentional practices, the first one I would love to challenge any parent listening to do is you can do this on a device you're holding right now, or you could do this on a piece of paper, but I want you to put down the name of each of your kids. I want you to write down their age. And then based on that particular kid and their age, what is in this moment of development your best entry point for connection? What's your best entry point for connection? And I want you to have that down somewhere that you come back to. And then I want you to change it as the answers change. The name's going to stay the same. The ages and entry points are going to look different. And then I want you to think about what you want to do with it beyond that. So, you know, I threw out the example of Legos. I have a a mom who told me recently she puts Legos in her iCal every Friday afternoon at 3 to remind her to just sit down and play some Legos with her elementary age son. And I have a dad who puts Fortnite in his iCal every Saturday (laughs) afternoon, and neither of them love doing those things. But I love that they would choose to remind themselves, literally putting it in their calendar because they know if they don't, they probably won't get around to it because it's a tool for the very thing we've been discussing. What else would you recommend as an intentional practice? Well, as we have been discussing technology, there are really probably two things I would recommend that are both part of an intentional practice. And one is the American Academy of Pediatrics on their website. They have a family media time calculator. So that's one of the questions we get from parents all the time. How much is too much time? What's a good time for this age child, that age child? And they actually have this calculator that you put in your child's age, different activities, all of those things. And it spits out a number for what a recommended screen time is for your child. And so we would definitely recommend heading over there. Also, we would recommend family technology contracts. And we are even going to have one downloadable that you can do, that you can get to through the show notes. But it can be so helpful to have a contract. Really, we would recommend one with each device you give your kids. But in general, outlining the amount of time you're going to use, you can outline how they can earn more screen time in terms of doing different chores and what consequences look like in terms of screen time. We have an episode on consistency, and we'll talk about how you can use technology to your advantage in that way, because it is definitely currency for a lot of kids. But a contract can involve all of those things, and then they sign it and you sign it. And that way, 
It creates more buy-in for your child. And also it can pull you out of some of the power struggles of when you say, I'm going to need your tablet. They already know that's a consequence that's heading their way. So I think contracts and anything that breaks things down into really practical ways is really helpful in terms of technology. Makes we it love really contracts. We love contracts. We're such ones. <laughs> but beyond our number, I genuinely believe it prepares kids so well for all of life. All of life works on a contract. It does. Like we all have contracts with our employers. I have a contract with the mortgage company for my house. I have a contract with AT&T. And if I pay my bill on time, I get to keep my phone or they'll turn it into an iPod touch. <laughs> there you and go. so it's a great tool for training kids in the way that life works. And lastly, we would invite you to think on your strongest memories of feeling connected to your own parents. And what were the ingredients of that? So if you were to think back on your own growing up, and again, we've acknowledged before, some people had the kinds of stories where they didn't feel especially connected to one or both parents. For some of you listening, maybe you felt incredibly connected to one or both of your parents. And What were the ingredients that were missing that you wanted but didn't experience if you didn't have that connection? And what were the ingredients that you did? If you were to think about some of your favorite moments with your parents, what were the ingredients that were involved? And chase after that memory for a bit until you can identify some of those ingredients. Again, either they were missed or they were experienced in ways that we think could help with this idea of being more connected. And now Melissa is going to anchor us to some great truth. David and Sissy have been talking about connecting and how important it is. And again, giving you so many great practical things. But I want to talk about you connecting to your father, to God himself. I was told a story by a mom Uh, a few years ago, and it stayed with me so much because I related to it, and you may too. A mom had had a new baby. She also had a son who was about seven years old, I think. And there were a lot of people there to meet the baby, lots going on. And the little boy started climbing the steps, and he yelled out to the whole group that was there. I think there were about 20 people there. And he said, if there's anybody here who loves me, raise your hand. I love that he had the freedom to ask that. And how many times do we want to say, okay, everybody stop. If anybody here likes dinner, raise your hand. If anybody here really wants to spend some time with me, raise your hand. Does anybody love me? Raise your hand. The freedom that a child has to express the longing that's in us, the encouragement that we all need, that we all want to believe that we connect, that somebody is interested in us, that somebody sees us. And so often, for you parents, you are the last to feel, to hear that you are loved. And I really do think that sometimes we do just want to say, okay, raise your hand if there's something you like about me, feeling free that's there. We all have that need. We all do, that need to connect, the need to connect with our Father, who is the one who says, oh, I love you. I love you so much. In uh, Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 22 says, Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Not avoid coming together, as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. We all need that encouragement. We all need to give it. And this scripture is so saying, let's spur each other on. Let's encourage each other. Let's even ask, will you raise your hand if you love me? We are made for connection, like this scripture is talking about. 
Let's come together. Let's spur each other on to love, to good deeds. That we're in the body of Christ and how important each person is. But the pandemic has made all of us in so many ways be isolated. There's been a lot of depression. There's been a lot of hurt and pain and a need to come together. In 1 Peter 5, 8, keep a cool head, he says. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. Now, that doesn't sound like a very encouraging verse, and it's not, except for the first part. Keep you cool. Keep a cool head. Because when we have negative thoughts, when we are so discouraged or we're so isolated, the door to the enemy is opened. We can start to hear accusations and words. In fact, the National Science Foundation has said that we have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day, and that 80% of those are negative and 45% are repetitive. And you think about those negative thoughts, the same ones over and over again. Those thoughts begin to control our lives. And parents, you get so down on yourself so much of the time. Gail Pitt put out a little pamphlet that I love, different scriptures to read, but in it is just a page that says on one side, God's voice, and on the other side, it says Satan's voice. And I have looked at this probably every day, but I want to remind you in being connected to your Father, to being connected to Jesus, that we are so loved and encouraged, and He has given us each other to spur us on to encouragement. But you've been affected by this pandemic. It's been a lonely time for so many people. And you're open and I'm open to accusations that don't come from God's voice. Here's a comparison for you. God's voice stills you. Satan's voice rushes you. God's voice leads you. Satan's voice pushes you. God's voice reassures you. Satan's voice frightens you. God's voice encourages you. Satan's voice can discourage you. God's voice comforts you. Satan's voice worries you. God's voice calms you. Satan's voice obsesses you. God's voice convicts you. And Satan's voice condemns you. For you as parents, you need reminders of what God says about you. Raise your hand to him and say, do you love me? And his voice in so many different ways, through someone else, through his word, through prayer, will still you, lead you, reassure you, encourage you, comfort you, calm you, and convict you. Thank y'all for being with us today in this conversation about connection. And we know, again, we could just go back to that idea. We know you're trying hard already. And we want to remind you that in light of us saying how important it is to connect, there is also grace. And we know life is hard and it's complicated and there is a lot going on. And I love, David, that you said those people that put Legos and Fortnite in their calendar did it on Friday afternoons. We do not want to add pressure to your parenting, to your schedule, because we know that you're trying hard. Just it can be super simple. It can be economical. No pressure here. So much grace. We know, again, that if you're parents who are listening to a parenting podcast, you're already there. You're already making the connection. So we are so grateful to be with you on this journey, and we'll see you next time. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. 
It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.